Thank you for joining our ed webinar today, Supporting the Grieving Student with Dr. David Schoenfeld. My name is Kayla Hansen, and I'm a marketing assistant with Brooks Publishing, the proud sponsor of today's ed webinar. We will also be offering continuing education certificates at the end of this webinar. If you're watching live, you'll get your certificate emailed to you within the next 24 hours. If you're joining us by phone or watching on demand, be sure to take the CE quiz in our archive at edweb.net slash inclusive education and you will receive your certificate. Also, if you're not a member already, be sure to, our community to, to join our community teaching all students practical strategies for inclusive classrooms to stay up to date with our upcoming webinars and other resources that we post there. Uh, today, Brooks Publishing is also offering a 20% off discount uh, for if you use the code EDWEBDS that expires Friday, August 31st, 2018. And today we're also going to be giving away three copies of Dr. Schoenfeld's book, The Grieving Student, A Teacher's Guide. Please be sure to stay active in the chat and we will select winners and announce them at the end. Without further, further delay, let me introduce our presenter today, Dr. David Schoenfeld. He established and directs the National Center for School Bere Crisis and Bereavement located at the Susan Dorak Peck School at so of Social Media at the University of Southern California. And for over 30 years, he has provided consultation and training to schools and supporting students and st staff at times of crisis and loss in the aftermath of numerous school crisis events and disasters within the United States. So Dr. Schoenfeld, I'm gonna hand it over to you to present. All right, well, thank you. What I plan on doing today is to discuss the role that schools and school professionals can play to support grieving students. In particular, also highlight a resource for professional development and technical support in this area through the Coalition to Support Grieving Students. Before I start my presentation, what I would like to do is just start with a brief video clip. And this video clip um, will show you a little bit about how one educator was able to approach a student who returned after the death of his mother. And I think it highlights very nicely that what we're hoping is that school professionals can be empathic and supportive, and it doesn't necessarily require that they provide any counseling, therapy, or intervention, but just the way they interact with students on this topic can provide enormous support. So let's start with that. Two years ago, I had a student come back from a funeral. And I, the kids told me um, that his mother was in the hospital and that's why he hasn't been at school. I said, oh, okay. So then when he came back, I said, Jonathan, he said, um, my mom passed. I had no idea. No one warned me. And I said, Jonathan, and I hugged him and then I looked at him and I was going to lose it at, because I, my heart, your mother, you know. And he looked at me and he goes, Jackie, please don't. And I said, okay. So he didn't want to talk about it. And the only thing I let him know is when you're ready, I'm here. And um, we're all here for you. And my door is always open. And, you know, uh, maybe three weeks later, he came to me and said, thank you. And I'm, I, you know, I look up from my desk, what are you thanking me for? He said, I just want you to know, thank you. And I said, you know, Jonathan, you're welcome. And I don't know what I did. He goes, you were here and I didn't have to talk about it. So I realized then, you know, I wish I realized that sooner. Sometimes you don't want to talk about it. You want to be somewhere where you can forget that you're grieving. So I think you have to, as an educator, it's like a dance. I'm going to take a step forward. If you start the dance with me, I can take the next step. If they stop and they're not able to, okay, we can stay here and just listen to the music. So I think in many ways, I like the metaphor that she used, that it's, it's like a dance. Um, and unfortunately, we don't often teach the dance moves. Uh, it's not just to school professionals. As a pediatrician, it's the same with medical professionals. And that's what I want to emphasize some of. One of the reasons for covering this topic is not only because it's an important topic, but also loss is common in the lives of children. We know that the vast majority of children, somewhere about nine out of 10 children, will experience the death of a close family and or a friend by the time they complete high school. And we know to that four to 5% of children in the United States specifically experience the death of a parent by the age of 16. 
So we know that uh, bereavement happens commonly among children. And so uh, that high frequency of loss for children is contrasted though by the limited preparedness of classroom educators and other school staff to support these grieving students. Um, a survey that was done by the American Federation of Teachers several years ago showed that 93% of classroom educators reported that they have never received any training in how to support a grieving student, even though more than 90% felt that they needed that training, and only 3% reported that such training was offered in their district. So it's, I, I think it's great uh, that this webinar is being held so that uh, it can be more broadly available. Now we know that most children will actually adjust to even a major loss, but that doesn't mean that they don't grieve and it doesn't mean that grieving isn't extremely difficult for them as they navigate that process. Bereavement we know has a significant and often long-term impact on learning, social and emotional development, behavior and adjustment. So what I'd like to do is I have a, another clip that I wanted to show that's brief that just um, gives a little voice to some of the students. I think loss is something that's very hard to describe in words. I wasn't paying attention to class a lot. And whenever they would ask me a question, I would be spaced out. Once or twice, I would bring up my dad, and everybody would be like, oh, do you want to talk about something else? A lot of people stayed away from me and didn't really talk to me a lot. A lot of my teachers actually did not do a lot, which was not helpful at all. It makes you feel kind of awkward, it makes you feel very, very alone. Teachers don't understand that even though it was a long time ago, it's still really hard for me. All the books that you pick up and read talk about how to handle a student in the first year, but very rarely do they address, okay, now this year is done, how are we going to handle them for the rest of the time? Because it doesn't go away and kids don't get over it. There was no training for loss or tragedy in my principalship training and I always felt as if it was something that was really needed. So uh, hopefully some of the voice of the children and the adults that work in schools would be helpful for the context. And one of the points I wanted to start with is that although I saw a comment that really educators should be informed when there's been a loss, um, in reality, many children in their families may not notify the school when the child experiences a death. And many children and adolescents may not even appear to be grieving when you see them. So it's uh, easy to kind of overlook some of these children. And there's multiple reasons for that. In one, at one level, adults may communicate unwittingly and unintentionally that death is not to be discussed. So if you think about it, a child who starts to mention the death of someone they care about is often met by you know, other adults who try and stop the conversation, look away, they don't want to continue it. And if you think about it, even if they speak with family members at home after a family member has died, their questions may actually lead to uh, silence from other adults or actually tears and the children may interpret that as they've done something wrong and they've made their parent or other family member upset and they may conclude that they really shouldn't ask those questions, it's inappropriate. And they'll turn around and try and support the adult who seems upset by their questions instead of asking for support themselves. Children may also though, particularly when they're younger, not yet understand what's happened or they may not appreciate the long-term or broader implications of the loss. So for example, I was talking to one father um, and his wife had died in a car accident. She was actually an educator um, and he was left with two young children. And he looked at me and he said, I live in dread of the day my daughter has her first period. Well, she was like five years old at the time. So she wasn't dreading that, but he was thinking about what might happen in the future. And I will say that when that girl grows up, and she does have her first period, she may really acutely miss her mother at that point, but she may not realize that until that time has come. Or some children may actually just be so overwhelmed by their feelings that they don't think they can talk about it in school. Because if they start to have the conversation, even a private conversation with a counselor, they may have to leave that counseling room and go back into class, and that might just be overwhelming. But uh, there also are children who do try and describe their feelings, but they express that grief indirectly through either their behavior or their play. There are actually a large range of games that children play where death is a theme. If you think about it, one of the first games about death is started by children in, uh, really it's in all uh, cultures across the world, and it occurs in the first year of life. Um, 
in about the second half of the first year of life, children start to develop what we call object permanence. Things that are out of sight remain in their memory and they can start to miss them. Um, and then they can start to grieve when they're not reunited. And as that time, that developmental stage occurs, children start to play what we call in the United States peekaboo. And in peekaboo, children fix their gaze on someone. There's separation as if the person has died. There's heightened awareness and concern and then joy at reunion. And children play that game over and over again. And you have to ask yourself, why are children drawn to that? And why do they have to keep playing it? And people have said it's because they're trying to deal with their earliest understanding of death. And it's interesting to note that peekaboo, when you translate it literally from Old English, is alive or dead. So that's actually what the game is about. And it's just one of many games that children will play where death is a theme. I go over that because a lot of times educators will talk to parents and they'll say, you know, my child is too young. They're four or they're five. They're too young to talk about death. You need to realize they've already been talking about it from their first year of life. Now, often what happens though, is even though children uh, do have questions and want and need support, many adults are often don't think they know what to say. And so when I went over the survey results from the American Federation of Teachers, um, teachers said that the one reason that they're most likely not to talk to children about this They've never received training and they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing or they're going to needlessly upset children or just somehow make matters worse. Sometimes uh, educators will tell me, well, you know, if I bring it up, it might upset children. Point out to them that if you ask children how they're doing after the death of someone close to them and they start crying, they're not crying because of your question. They're crying because they're grieving and you've given them an invitation to share how they feel. You haven't caused the distress. But a lot of teachers will still say, well, I'm afraid I'm going to say the wrong thing and I'll just make it worse. So it's better to say nothing. But I would say nothing says an awful lot to kids and none of it is good. It communicates that adults are either unconcerned, unaware, uncaring, unable, or simply unwilling to be of assistance. And that leaves young children very confused often about what's happened and what it means. It leaves younger and older children unsupported. And it just requires children of all ages to grieve alone. Those aren't messages or intentions that I think any of us have. So saying nothing is not the right thing to say. Um, so what I have found is useful is actually going over um, what are some of the wrong things to say. The bottom line is if you care about kids and you're empathic and you're genuine, they really will forgive almost anything you say because they will first, they'll hear fundamentally that you care and you want to help. That is the most important message. So I wouldn't really worry exactly about what you say, um, but let me go over some of the things that you might wish to reconsider. Now, um, this, this slide just lists some of those things. The first one is, you know, don't try and cheer up survivors. A lot of times people will say things like, you know, I know it hurts uh, very much right now, but I know you'll feel better with it within a short period. Instead, you should really allow them to have their grief. Um, often what we'll find is that people will say things like, well, at least he's not in pain anymore. At least you still have a brother. Uh, at least you still have another parent. I would say anything that begins with at least is probably something you should reconsider. Uh, because usually when somebody says that to another person who is grieving, it's really their way of communicating that the grief is causing distress to them and they don't want to witness it anymore. And could you please, you know, cheer yourself up so that I don't have to see you in distress? That doesn't really help the children recover. You also don't want to encourage them to be strong or cover their emotions. So comments like, you know, you don't want to cry in front of the other students or you're the man of the house now are not useful uh, comments and they just further restrict children's comfort and ability to communicate their distress. You should feel free to express your feelings and demonstrate genuine empathy. Sometimes I know people are, you know, people will say, well, what if I, I might get tearful or I might get sad or a little choked up? And actually, that's not a bad thing. Kids want to know that you care about them. And so if they are sharing something that's devastating to them and you get a little choked up or tearful, that that isn't a burden to them. That's actually helpful. But I would avoid statements such as I know exactly what you're going through. You can't really know what someone else is going through. You should ask them. You don't want to say things like, you know, you must be angry because you don't want to tell people how they ought to feel. You want to ask them how they are feeling. And I think the most common or, or one of the more um, subtle 
uh, issues is the sharing of your personal loss experiences to try and connect with the child. So statements like both my parents died when I was your age um, may seem like a way of connecting and showing that you have some you know, common experience around loss. But the problem is that whenever you do share your own personal experience, you make a comparison. And in this particular case, you might actually be competing for sympathy. So if you ask, a, if you share your personal loss experience and the child thinks it's worse than their own experience, they may feel that they have to comfort you. And that's not really what we're intending to do. Um, if you share a loss experience, let's, and I knew about one nurse um, who was talking to some parents and their child had died and over the weekend. And, and she said, oh, I know what you're going through. My dog died this weekend. And they were deeply insulted that she would equate their child with a dog or a pet. So the issue is if you make those personal comparisons, either you beat the child and you, you pull the sympathy and the attention toward you, and really it's all about the child um, and their grief, or you say something that's insulting. So it really doesn't generally work. Now, again, these are suggestions for when you are a school professional that's supporting a child. It's different if you're talking with a peer, you know, a family member, um, you've gone through your own personal loss and you're looking for support. But when you're trying to focus on the kids' needs, these are the suggestions to keep in mind. What you really want to do is to allow the child and the family, if you're talking with the whole family, to be upset, tolerate their unpleasant affect without trying to change it. And I tell people, a lot of times they ask, is this normal, is this abnormal? And I tell them, just accept the reactions while suspending your judgment. You wanna intervene only when safety and health is a concern. So if someone says they're going to hurt themselves or someone else, you have that suspicion, then that's an emergency and you don't ignore that even when someone is grieving. But short of when they're not gonna be hurting themselves or others, it's really best to just kind of allow it to occur um, and not try and judge it. Let me go over then some of the reactions that you will see and how to address them. So a common one is children's guilt. Uh, when we're thinking of young children, their thought processes are limited in a number of ways. And one of them is what we refer to as egocentrism, which is typical in a young child. Calvin explains it better than anyone I've seen. He says, here I'm at peace with the world. I'm completely serene. And Hobbes asks, why is that? And he explains, I've discovered my purpose in life. I know why I was put here and why everything exists. And when Hobbes asks why, he says, yes, I'm here. So everybody can do what I want. Now that's the egocentrism of a young child. Calvin is even more perceptive. Um, and when Hobbes says it's nice to have that cleared up, he adds, once everyone accepts it, they'll be serene too. So this is the egocentrism that children generally have, particularly young children. They approach death the same way. Here, Calvin explains, don't die, a little raccoon. It wouldn't be very grateful of you to break my heart. It's a very egocentric perspective on loss, but very typical of what you will see in children. And to be quite honest, you see this in adults as well when they're under stress. We also know that in addition to egocentrism, young children have limited understanding of causality. So they don't know why important things happen, including why someone would die. If you are egocentric and you don't know the cause and you need to understand it, often what you will find is that children will rely on magical thinking, uh, where they will assume that they are the center of the universe and if something has occurred, it occurred because of them. Either it's their thought, their wishes, their actions, or their failure to act was somehow contributory to the death that occurred. Now, this magical thinking is often reinforced by parents. So parents, um, you know, the example that I, I often use um, was even though I raised my kids to believe in Santa Claus, and I have nothing against Santa Claus, but if you think about it, if you raise your children to think that on December 5th, if they eat their vegetables one night at dinner, Somebody in the North Pole is gonna know about that and actually care, even though Santa doesn't really have a reputation for placing a lot of emphasis on vegetables in his own diet. I mean, you don't leave out a plate of vegetables for him. Uh, you leave out cookies or something like that. So somehow Santa Claus is gonna care that you've had your vegetables and he's gonna go and instruct elves as a result to make a toy of your liking, even though you haven't asked for it yet, and then he's going to deliver it by sled through the middle of the night. And here's a kind of a spoiler alert. That's pretty far-fetched. This whole scenario from a causal relationship is very far-fetched. But if a child actually believes that that simple action one night at dinner can cause all of these very, you know, 
far-fetched things to occur, then you can imagine that if they kick their sister and then two weeks later she develops leukemia and dies, that's their fault. And the logic behind that, I think is far more believable than the logic around Santa Claus. So I think what happens is when you use magical thinking, it makes children feel far more powerful than they actually are. And that's great when good things happen, but there's a downside when bad things happen, such as death, because it results in guilt. So I think it's really important that we reassure children of their lack of responsibility when a death has occurred. Here Calvin kind of explains it. He calls his mom and he says, a big dog knocks me down and he stole Hobbes. Because I tried to catch him, but I couldn't, and now I've lost my best friend. And his mother says, well, Calvin, if you wouldn't drag that tiger everywhere, things like this wouldn't happen. And he points out, there's no problem so awful, you can't add some guilt to it and make it even worse. And I think that's very common, uh, particularly in bereavement. Um, so again, you want to reassure children of their lack of responsibility, even when there's no logical reason why they should feel guilty. At least no logical reason from the adult's perspective. So um, the way that I often approach this in children is that I will say, what I will say to them is whenever something truly bad happens, we often feel badly. And when we feel badly, we wonder what we did bad. And I will say to them, there's nothing you did, didn't do, should have done, or could have done that resulted in your loved one dying. But I wonder if that's something you think about because a lot of kids told me that that is something that they feel about. And just kind of acknowledging that guilt is a common reaction, and just because you feel guilty doesn't mean you actually are guilty, often allows children to open up and tell you about their guilt feelings. And what I would say is I have done this work for over 30 years, and so far I've only seen two, maybe three situations where I didn't actually get children or adults to acknowledge their guilt feelings. And this guilt is something that we bring with us into adulthood. And when we're under stress after a death, we often go back to those feelings. I've gone to schools when there's been a death that's occurred, and I've found many of the teachers and other school professionals talking about their guilt. I've gone to schools where there's been, you know, an, an individual who's murdered others in the community and then had, and you know, they were 18, 19 years of age. And when I talk about guilt as a common reaction, that second and third grade teachers who taught this, this adult when they were a child feel that the, it was their fault that they didn't do something uh, when they were teaching the child to try to prevent it. So guilt is extremely um, common. Another thing to think about is the misconceptions um, and literal misinterpretations that you can see. For young children, their thought processes are quite concrete and literal and they approach death the same way. Um, here Calvin asks if the milk is spoiled, and his mom says, smell it and see, and he says, I'm not gonna smell it, you smell it. Without asking questions about why he's asking that, um, she just says, oh, for goodness sake, here it's fine, acting a bit annoyed. And then later he explains, um, I don't take chances with a product that prints the date you might expire. So children may have these literal misinterpretations, and often they're not picked up on. So for some children, you might tell them that there's going to be, you know, a funeral and the body will be placed in a casket. And then they say they don't want to go there because they don't want to see that. And we assume that they don't want to see their loved one uh, after they've died or see a dead body. But sometimes it's when you say to children that the body's placed in the casket, they assume that the head must be placed someplace else and they don't want to see a loved one decapitated. You don't necessarily know how they've misinterpreted what you said. So along those lines, you know, religious explanations can be shared with children of any age by their parents and other family members and their faith-based organizations. It's generally not shared by classroom educators in public schools. Um, so although the religious explanations can be shared, we need to recognize that they're abstract in general, and they may not provide all of the comfort or explanation that will help very young children. So they should not be the only explanation of death that's given. I remember one child who was told that his brother was such a good little baby that uh, God wanted him back at his side as an angel. And then he made it very clear that when he went to church, which was God's home, he wasn't that good a kid and he didn't want to be called back to the other side. So his parents did not pick this up for months and didn't realize that that's why he was misbehaving at church all the time. 
So you see sometimes the explanations that are given may actually be misinterpreted by young children and actually just cause further distress. So when kids are acting differently or upset, you want them to ask, you want to ask them what they understand about what you've explained or what others have explained to them. So children need to be given uh, developmentally appropriate explanations and then ask what they understand. And as they explain it back to adults, the misconceptions will become more evident and they can be, then they can be corrected. And so here is a slide which talks about where you can get some free material on how to support grieving students. Um, and this booklet goes into more detail about kind of very young children's conceptual understanding of death, and it can be freely downloaded at grievingstudents.org. Just go to the tab that says order free material, and you can order it in English and Spanish. You can download a PDF um, to read and to photocopy, but you can also order free booklets that can be sent to you uh, at no cost. The New York Life Foundation supports this, and at this point is even paying for the shipping and handling, so there is no charge. Those who want to go into even more detail and understand more about this topic may wish to look at the booklet, uh, The Grieving Student Teacher's Guide, um, which is published by Brooks Publishing. Um, I co-authored this with Marcia, Marcia Quackenbush, and we also wrote together that booklet that I just shared with you. I've been talking about younger children, but adolescents also have issues. And society often perceives that the impact of the death on an adolescent is somehow less taxing than it is for young children. Adolescents are generally expected to be more mature and more like adults, and therefore somehow better able to handle the consequences. And adults often wrongly assume that because adolescents have the ability to think rationally, that they therefore somehow understand what's occurred and need no further explanations, even though we provide explanations to surviving adults. And they may assume that since adults are capable of independent thought and action, and in general, are often less amenable to adult assistance and guidance, that they don't need the support and outreach services at the time of the death. In reality, adolescents do. They need both explanation and support, but they're often left unsupported when a family member dies. The services are almost always extended to the parents and other adults, who then will often rely on the adolescent children to provide them with comfort and perhaps to take on more adult responsibilities, um, you know, providing childcare to younger children or helping with chores at home which is part of the reason why you want to interview adolescents alone. And you also want them to find out how they're doing so that you're not asking them in front of the adults as they may feel they need to support the adults. And we sometimes also need to recommend that adults get support for themselves so they don't depend too heavily on the children. I also wanted to address the issue of cumulative loss. A common misconception in communities that are characterized by high rates of violence and death is that children in these communities have somehow become accustomed to loss. They fail to see many acute expressions of grief, and therefore they just conclude the, child, the children are no longer grieving these additional losses. Students attending schools within neighborhoods characterized by high rates of community violence, poverty, and loss generally lack the sufficient support to cope effectively with these deaths, and they actually emerge more vulnerable to the impact of future loss after each of these deaths. These cumulative losses are neither protective nor are they desensitizing. And in reality, children don't just get used to the death of their peers. Um, instead, students in these communities may come to learn that adults are not generally forthcoming with supportive services after a death has occurred or view adults in their lives as either unable or unwilling to establish a safe environment and unprepared to provide assistance. So they may just conclude there's little value in seeking such assistance and they may appear to show no reaction after a death. Their failure to ask for support is not because they don't need or would benefit from the support, but rather they believe it's futile to ask. And they may then turn instead to their peers for support or actually engage in behaviors that only serve them, um, only serve to put them at further risk of harm. So children who are afraid of dying from community violence may actually join gangs in some situations if they perceive that's the sole option available to help them um, find protection. They may actually engage in risky behaviors, not because they believe themselves to be immortal, but because they're actually fearful of their own mortality, and they need to challenge their fears by engaging in the same behaviors they know to be dangerous, in part so they can survive and prove to themselves that they will be okay. 
And in those situations, we refer to it as counterphobic behavior or reactive risk-taking. Um, and in this setting, it becomes even more critical for schools to make sure that school staff take proactive efforts to provide support. And sometimes the adults, though, don't want to see that. I went to one community uh, that's known for its gang violence, and I went over this information with the staff at a school. And one of the staff members just said, you know, um, you don't understand our community. Um, and I asked him why he said that. And he said, well, in our community, it's normal for children to be part of gangs. And I said, well, I understand that many children do join gangs, but that's not necessarily a positive thing for them. And he looked at me and he said, in our community, it's normal for children to murder other children. And I looked at him and I said, it's never normal for children to murder children. And as soon as we refer to it as normal, we suggest we don't have to do something about it. I said, and I'm never going to be okay with children murdering other children. But he just kept telling me, you don't understand our community. I said, well, I don't need to understand your community perfectly to know that we really need to protect children from dying. Um, and it got to the point where I actually had to take a break in the session because he kept arguing with me. And as soon as I took the break, he came up to me and he said, you know what, you're right. I got to stop saying that. Please start the session up so that we can figure out how to help these kids. So sometimes we see so much distress around us that we have to tell ourselves that it's not really there. But that doesn't really help the kids. These kids are even more vulnerable and they deserve and need our support even more so. Let me turn to now some practical suggestions. And one of them is on funeral attendance. And a lot of times people will say to me, well, why would school staff provide advice on funerals? Well, part of the reason is because uh, schools may be the only um, organization or service provider that actually talks to families before the funeral has occurred. Yes, their pediatrician and other healthcare provider could give this advice, but they often don't contact them before the funeral. So at least giving some basic advice about how to prepare children for a funeral, or at least you know, forwarding them written information is very useful. So what we recommend is that children of any age should be invited to participate in funerals and other commemorative and memorial events to their level of comfort. So you want to describe what's likely to occur and then ask children if they have any questions and then ask them, do they wish to participate? And if so, how? Um, I also think it's very helpful um, to assign a mentor for that experience, someone who understands and has a good relationship with the child, but is not personally grieving themselves. That might be a babysitter, a more distant relative, a neighbor, or could be a member of the school system. And that person would just accompany the child so that the child can participate to the level they wish. If they start to look uncomfortable or fidgety or squirming, then you can just say to the child, maybe we should step outside, go for a walk. You know, I'd like to get something from my car. Could you come with me? And then ask them, do you want to go back in? Do you want to stay by the door? What would you like to do? And if kids know that they can step out um, and they can kind of moderate their degree of participation, I've actually never had a problem with children participating in over three decades. Um, but you don't want to force or coerce children to do something that they're uncomfortable with. Schools should also be aware of community resources, such as local bereavement centers and bereavement camps, and offer them to families as resources, and then provide follow-up. We have to remember that grieving is long-term. So you, it's really something they're going to do over the rest of their lives. So you want to check in with the child over time. Don't just offer to, to talk to the child in the future if they have questions, because a lot of times they're not going to come up with those questions or approach you, but check in periodically. Um, and in many ways, I consider this the unfinished business of bereavement. So you want to follow up with the child around the time of anniversaries, of the death, or of the birthday of the deceased, and special occasions like holidays, to just recognize the fact that those things may remind them about the loss that's occurred and the continuing impact that they have. This last video clip that I'm going to show um, talks about the situation of grief triggers. We were making bookmarks that said father, and then we write, write words. And um, she, the teacher was explaining it, and I, I was like right about to cry because I couldn't make one. So I asked to go to the bathroom and then I started crying in the bathroom. It's not always the very um,
common things that are going to be grief triggers. Um, it's not always Father's Day that's going to trigger a grief. It could be career day. It could be what does you know your parent do for a living that is going to trigger. It could be the day of his birthday and they can go to school. And it could be a very sad day for them and no one else really understands that that day is sad because it's his birthday. Or it could be you know a trip to the cemetery. Right now my biology class is studying blood vessels and my dad died of an aneurysm so we were talking about disorders and my teacher talked about aneurysm and she asked what could happen with an aneurysm and I raised my hand and I told her that it could burst and if that was in the brain it could be fatal so we talked about that and it's not my biology teacher's fault it's a unit I understand that completely but it just it's a reminder of how ironic things can be sometimes someone can say something that's not relevant to them but it can have a really big effect on you Today in Spanish class, actually, my friend Kate, she's a great friend of mine, she, um, we were joking because we had a biology test the previous period, and it was a pretty hard test. So we were joking, we were saying that we were going to get heart attacks or we were going to pass out, and she was like, hey, I have an aneurysm. And she, she was like, she just kind of began shaking and stuff, and I didn't get mad at her because she didn't understand and I hadn't told her because I just met her this year. I encounter grief triggers a fair amount because after such a long time, to people seven years sounds like a long time, it would seem that I wouldn't, but I actually find a lot of random things that just remind me of my dad. And that's okay with me because I actually enjoy them a little bit, understanding more of him. So grief, trima uh, grief triggers are very common uh, in the classroom setting. And so what we want is just to have school professionals let children and their parents know that this can happen and then work out a safety plan. So you want to provide a safe space or an adult the student can talk to when they're having a grief trigger and set procedures for the student to obtain that support ahead of time. So for example, I had one teacher that what they worked out with the student was that he would get up, walk toward the door, take a tissue from the tissue box and leave the room and she knew he was having a grief trigger, knew where he was going and knew when he would come back. I had another student uh, who was in a, I think it was a special education classroom, but her father had died. And what she worked out with the teacher was that she would put up the hood of her hoodie and that meant she was having what they both called a hoodie moment. And she didn't want to be called on. She wasn't really accessible to participate fully. And the teacher respected that and felt you know much better um, that the student was at least there and able to able to participate to some level. Um, so working out that type of communication that doesn't draw too much attention to the child when they're grieving and having that grief trigger can be very helpful. You might let the student call a parent or a family member if necessary, or provide permission and encouragement to see the school social worker, school counselor, or the school nurse and then offer some private time after class uh, with the teacher to talk about their feelings or with one of these other professionals. And if children know that they can leave when they're feeling overwhelmed, bottom line is they usually don't have to leave because it's that feeling trap that's so upsetting to kids. So ironically, when you work out a plan for how they can leave the classroom, they actually don't need to leave as much and they're more likely to stay there and be able to participate. I think staff can also work with children and their families to help anticipate and minimize these likely grief triggers. So for example, there was a discussion in the video about the Father's Day activity that was upsetting to the child. Well, if the teacher had just introduced that activity by saying, you know, some of you may not have a father who is alive or currently living with you. Those of you who are in that situation, you can still do this exercise thinking about your memories of your dad but you can also pick another male that's important in your life. And that way we can all participate fully. It doesn't take very long to say that. Um, and I think that that becomes very important to kids. And it isn't just kids who have experienced deaths. It may be because their parent has been incarcerated or deployed um, or is just, you know, dealing with drug or substance use and not being available to them, or they've been divorced or they don't even, or the parents are divorced or they don't even know their dad for whatever reason. And so you wanna make sure that you include everyone in your class in the activities. Now this gets then to the importance of professional self-care. It's important to recognize that it's distressing to be with people of any age who are grieving, but children in particular. And when they are in distress, it's distressing to watch. 
If someone is crying or upset and you're trying to help, it's really hard to feel like you're helping them, even when you are. So it's critical that staff find ways to have their own personal needs met and they appreciate and address the impact supporting children who are grieving or traumatized is having on them personally and professionally. I went to one school um, that invited me over the summer, right before the start of the school year, to try and do some in-service training on how to support children around uh, trauma and loss. And I actually spent a long period of time with them over several days in this in-service training. I think it was like five hours of presentations to the entire school staff. Um, and at the end of that week, on Friday afternoon, one of the teachers came to me with me and she told me that even though she was supposed to set up her classroom for the start of school on Monday, that she had been unable to walk into her classroom. And then I asked her why, because there, there was no death that had occurred in the school, no specific traumatic event. There had been some losses of students and staff, but they were all outside of the school building. And she just looked at me, if I go in and I set up that classroom, that means on Monday morning, I'm gonna meet a whole new group of kids. And if one of them dies, I don't think I'm gonna be able to tolerate it. So I'm afraid to walk into the classroom. So fortunately she mentioned that to us, uh, had conversation with her permission, but the principal was very supportive, hired a substitute for Monday morning. We offered support over the weekend. We talked with her and she came in on Monday morning and went straight into the classroom. She just told the principal, I need to be in the classroom. These kids need me. That's where I belong. And she continued to teach. But the issue is, I don't know how many educators or other school professionals face that same dilemma. And I suspect it's a lot more than we appreciate. We also need to remember that someone else's distress may actually uncover or resurface feelings of loss or trauma from the professional's own life. I went to one elementary school where a student uh, had found a gun, accidentally discharged it and killed his cousin. And as I was talking with the teaching staff about how to support these kids, one of the staff started sobbing and we had to stop the workshop and provide support. And she disclosed for the first time that she had miscarried, but she had miscarried 20 years prior. And this was the first time that she was able to actually share that with her peers. And those feelings came to the forefront when she was talking about how to support kids related to gun violence. So we need to create a culture where it's just simply okay at times to be upset and where everyone looks out when something upsetting happens and where everyone looks out for each other normalizes asking for help and models a willingness to accept assistance. And it has to be a place where people help each other see the benefit of the important role that schools can play in supporting children in the aftermath of a crisis and loss and help them to do that. Um, I did when I was speaking at one workshop and after the workshop, um, some people stayed after for, qu for questions. And finally, there was only one person left in the ballroom all the way at the back door. And I waited for him to come up and he didn't approach me. So I went back and spoke to him, asked him if he had a question. And he said, no. And I asked him, can I help you? And he just started crying and he said, I don't know if you can help me. And as he was crying, he explained to me that he was the superintendent of a school system outside of the United States. And there had been an accident where about five of the students died. And he said it had been a couple of years and he was able to cope with it, but periodically it was really upsetting to him. And he just, you know, he looked at me and he said, it still bothers me these kids died. Maybe I should retire. And I just looked at him and I said, if you ever wake up one day and you don't care if the kids die, that's when you should retire. You have no right to be a superintendent. But think about it, that's a pretty low bar that you care that they're not, that they survive. We, we, need, to, we need to have that feeling. And so I said, it is not a problem that you care it's a problem with what you do with that care so that you don't hurt yourself. So I do want to leave some time for questions. So I'm just going to end by talking a little bit about the resource for the Coalition to Support Grieving Students. So several years ago, we established with the New York Life Foundation, the Coalition to Support Grieving Students. We started with 10 organizations as the founding members. It included the two major teachers unions, the AFT and the NEA, four school superintendent, um, and principal organizations. Uh, that includes the AFSA, the American Federation of School Administrators. I'm actually at their conference now and will be presenting tomorrow to them again. But it also includes the National Association for Elementary School Principals and Secondary School Principals and the School Superintendents Association. And then it also includes the American School Counselors Association, 
the National Association for School Nurses, the National Association for School Psychologists, and the School Social Work Association of America. So it really includes a lot of the major professional organizations, and they've come together, developed material that I'm going to share with you, um, and they've all endorsed the material and placed their logo on it. Since that time, we've added more organizations, and these are just some examples of additional supporting organizational members. It includes, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Boys and Girls Club of America, Save the Children, a, a number of different groups. We're actually up to over 60 uh, of the organizations that have joined the coalition. And together, we've created um, this website, grievingstudents.org. Um, and this is freely open to the general public, so uh, everything I tell you about, you can go view at this point. Uh, you don't have to belong uh, to the coalition for it. And that it, it, actually, we have six different sections uh, for these training modules, and each of them contain about two to three video modules. Each video is accompanied by a handout that summarizes major points. I showed you some clips that are actually included in those modules. And the modules, except for the first one, are all 10 to 15 minutes in length and can actually even be viewed on your phone. Um, the sections include topics related to conversation and support. And in the first uh, module, it's actually about 30 minutes long because we, it includes actor simulations. We used uh, equity actors uh, in New York City, and we went through simulations of a teacher um, informing or first talking to a child about a death. Um, and the other topics are advice on what, to, what not to say to a grieving child, providing support over time, and how to facilitate peer support. We have a section on um, developmental and cultural considerations. We have another section on practical considerations. It includes things like funeral attendance, secondary and cumulative loss, and the coordinating services and supporting transitions, as well as the role of social media in supporting grieving students. Then we have a section on reaction and triggers that talk about the impact on learning, guilt and shame, other reactions and grief triggers. And another section on professional preparation and self-care. And the last section is crisis and other special circumstances. Um, this really goes over bereavement in the context of a school crisis, the unique context of suicide, how to facilitate commemoration memorialization in school settings, and how to address students or staff that have a potentially life-limiting condition. Now, in addition to the video modules and their associated print materials, we also have another section that's just labeled additional resources. We have created some additional modules. For example, uh, we have one on how to deal with line of duty deaths uh, in the police. And we also have one that we developed with several groups, um, that Military Child Education Coalition, DODEA, Department of Defense, Education Activity, and TAPS on how to support children who have experienced a family member who died in the line of duty in the military. We also provide uh, guidance documents there that can be downloaded that are just practical guidelines that have been developed by the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement on how to respond to the death of a student or staff, whether it's from all causes, and there's one just dealing with suicide. We also have teacher training modules that you can download that have slides, and when you open it in the notes view, you'll actually find the whole presenter notes written out so that someone can use that to structure a presentation. We have family and school staff booklets, articles, and other online resources. And for those dealing with a current crisis and wanting advice from an expert from the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement, there's an email and toll-free phone number for media contact that you'll also find at the site. So I just wanted to end by uh, inviting you to, um, and your colleagues, to take advantage of the resources of the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement. It was established in 2005 with funding from the September 11th Children's Fund and the National Philanthropic Trust. And our current funding is from the New York Life Foundation. We originally created the center to promote an appreciation of the role that schools can serve to support students, staff, and families at times of both crisis and loss to enhance the training and professional education programs, and to serve as a resource for information, training materials, consultation, and technical assistance, which we provide at no charge to schools. So if you want information about our center, you can go to schoolcrisiscenter.org, um, and you'll find a range of materials there. Further information and materials can also be found, uh, as I said, at our website. Um, so as an example, if you see the little 
kind of uh, orange banner at the top. Um, if you click on that, you can actually do a guidance document about how to talk to children about shootings and terrorist attacks that appears in the media. So um, there's a range of different resources. And for this last slide, it's just other ways to kind of interact with the center. Um, we have a toll-free number, which is available on the slide and can be seen at either of the websites. You can go to the website for the center, but you can also email us at info at schoolcrisiscenter.org and um, we will receive the email and respond to you with advice. You can also join our Facebook page, um, our Twitter account, or our LinkedIn account. Um, so we encourage you, please visit us, call us, like us, share us, um, and that will allow us to send you information um, as new materials become available. And also we send out information around the holidays about how to support kids that are grieving in the holidays. We'll, we'll give you more timely resources um, as different events occur uh, and based on the time of year. So I'm now gonna turn this over to uh, some questions from people. Um, and I appreciate you all taking part in the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Schoenfeld. I know I speak for everyone watching when I say that this is full of amazing resources. Um, and I know that people are anxious to have you answer some questions for them. So let me get this set up for you. So one of our qu first questions was, how can I assist students in a preschool setting? I know you talked a little bit about um, young students who have magical thinking and egoti egotism. How would you approach that? Okay. So when dealing with very young children, they may not even understand some of the basic concepts related to death. So let me go over those four concepts quickly. One is that death is irreversible. When someone dies, they don't come back to life again. Um, and, you know, we often say things like, you know, the person has gone on a long journey. Um, those, those comments confuse young children. And if children don't believe that the uh, death is irreversible, they actually have no reason to mourn. They'll just wait for the person to come back. They may actually even be angry when the person hasn't called or returned for important occasions. So they need to know that death is irreversible. A lot of times people will say to me, well, young children, preschoolers can't understand that. Actually, they can't understand that. It's not a very complicated concept. Um, I remember explaining it to my own child about a family member who died when she was only 20 months old. And when I explained that the person had died, she just looked, she didn't know what the word meant. And I said, well, this person is not coming back. Um, and she said, not coming. And I said, the person is all gone. And she went over to her, the bag, took out the baby book, turned to the page where the child turns over the cereal bowl and says, all gone. And she said, you know, this relative, all gone. And I said, yes, she never looked for her again. So I think all gone is something that kids learn from a very young age. I will tell you, even adults have trouble accepting that someone has died and isn't returning, but it isn't hard to understand. It's just hard to accept. So one thing is that it's irreversible. They also need to know that when someone dies, all life functions cease. Kids initially assume everything that exists is alive. We call that animism. So a rock is alive, a television is alive. And we confuse them when we say things like the television died or the car died and that's why I'm late. So then they start to understand, okay, things that move are alive, but that means a robot is alive and a tree isn't. So it takes a while for them to understand all of life functions and what are living functions, but they need to be told that all life functions cease completely at the time of death. Otherwise, they tend to be concerned about physical suffering of deceased. So you'll find that if you say to a kid, well, why don't you draw a picture and we'll put it in the coffin for your mom, they think their mother can actually see it. And then they're worried that they can see that they're dark, they can hear the dirt, they can tell that they're being buried, essentially alive. So children tend to focus on physical suffering of deceased if they don't understand that all life functions cease completely. They need to know the real causes of death, we call that causality, uh, because if they don't, they're more likely to assume that they did something wrong or the person did something wrong, and that leads to guilt and shame. And they also need to know that death is inevitable. All living things eventually die. If we say, if we actually have kids believe that they're not going to die or those they care about won't, when someone does die, they have to ask, why was that person chosen? And if that person is generally chosen because of something the child did wrong or something the person did wrong, and that leads to guilt and shame again. So they need to understand that death is kind of 
inevitable so that they can appreciate the fact that when someone dies, it isn't necessarily someone's fault. So those are the kind of the four concepts. I think the main thing, particularly with very young preschool children, is to continue to be a physical presence and an emotional presence to them, to ask them what they're thinking about and how they're feeling, and to address those concerns. Okay, great. Um, another question we received is, do you have advice for helping grieving students when a teacher dies or a member of staff? Yes, so when a teacher dies or a member of the staff dies, I think we also have to tell children uh, what has happened in simple and direct terms without going into a lot of the details um, and then provide them ongoing support. Uh, recognize that when someone they care about dies in the school, they may worry about the death of someone else they care about. So that's a common concern. In terms of very practical suggestions, we suggest that if a teacher has died, it's probably best that another teacher perhaps from the same grade level or from the grade level below that may already know the students and have a relationship, be at least temporarily placed to substitute for that class. Putting a substitute teacher who doesn't know any of the students and doesn't know the school and isn't that experienced into that role can be pretty overwhelming for not only the kids, but also for the substitute teacher. So often what we suggest is put another teacher in that role or one of the staff who's from the school crisis team or someone else who has that experience and comfort, and then get a substitute for that other teacher's class, at least for time being. So those are, that's one of the practical suggestions that we recommend. Okay. Um, how would you approach a student whose parents have requested that you not discuss the death? If parents have requested that they, you know, not talk about it with the child, I think what you can do is ask them why that's the case. Um, but you can also not talk about the death in any detail, but still provide supports. So, um, you know, if the child comes in and they said, you know, my mom died, but I don't want to talk about it, or the parents say, I don't want to talk about it, you can say is, I understand you've been through something difficult. Let me know how I can help you with that. If it's hard for you right now to study, or one of the assignments is difficult for you, you want me to make some change or adaptation, let me know. I'm here to help you with that. Maybe an oral report is gonna be very difficult for you right now because you feel you know, like everyone's staring at you and you don't wanna stand up in front of the class. Or maybe you don't have the ability to concentrate at home and do a written report and you prefer to do a video project. Maybe you need a little bit more time around tests. Or maybe a particular assignment is gonna be hard. I mean, I remember kids, you know, there's one kid who was asked to write a report about the deaths in Shakespeare. Her mother had just died. She said she couldn't do it. The teacher failed her. I mean, we really need to let kids be able to tell us that right now this isn't working for me or I just need some adaptation and adjustment. So educators uh, and any other school professionals as well may not be in the position to counsel children about their bereavement, but they still can support grieving students in their classes. Um, and I would say at a very minimum, that's what they should be doing. So kind of pulling on from, going on from there, would you say that that's applicable to students whose parents may be in and out of jail or incarcerated perhaps for life? Um, would, do you have any other suggestions yeah. added to that? Those type of situations are what are sometimes called in the field ambiguous loss. I, I don't particularly like the term because it suggests to people that it's somehow unclear whether or not it is a loss. That isn't really what's meant by the term. Ambiguous loss just means the boundaries of the loss are ambiguous. So if someone's divorced, for example, if parents are divorced and the, let's say one of the parents moves far away or out of state, they, you know, they can still return and they sometimes do return and they may communicate by phone and they may not always be present. So there's always this, does this mean we're gonna have Thanksgiving all together? But what about graduation? We can't have two graduations. You know, are both parents going to be there? So the boundaries are constantly being renegotiated, and that can make it even more difficult in some ways. Um, but children can be reassured by the fact that they will still see the person or that they may return, even if they're incarcerated for life. They may still get out on parole. They may still be able to visit them. So I think with ambiguous losses, a lot of what I've described is equally relevant. Um, but sometimes it actually even requires more discussion with kids because it's not clear. I had one a couple that came to me. They had a young child 
he had a very serious medical problem that was, you know, it was one of the serious muscular dystrophies. And they, the parents looked at me and they said, well, we've decided to get divorced, but we both want to raise him together. So we're going to stay in the same home and co-parent and raise him, but we're divorced. How do we explain that to our child? I'm like, I don't even understand what you're doing. You know, like that's what you, if you're co-parenting, raising your child together and getting along with each other, that's what we hope in a marriage. So I don't know what you mean by how to explain we're divorced, but doing all of this together. So you can imagine that's just hard to explain to a kid. It was hard for me to understand uh, what they were proposing. So I think in these ambiguous law situations, you can use some of the same approaches and principles, but recognize the fact that it may be a little less clear um, on some of the boundaries of what's occurred. Okay. Um, would you say it's okay to share with the class about your own personal experience with death or loss? I think it's okay in many situations to share your personal experiences if you're sharing it to help illustrate a point to children. Um, I think if they're dealing with an acute loss themselves, you know, as an individual, as I said, sharing your own personal experience may draw attention away from them. But in other situations, um, it can be a learning experience. I had one kindergarten teacher who shared with the students that she was pregnant and expecting a child. And over time, she talked about what the family was doing to get ready for the child. You know, they were preparing the nursery. And she would show them in a picture book how big the fetus was at certain points and what, you know, the, the fetus was starting to develop. And then near the end of her pregnancy, she lost the pregnancy. And she decided to tell the children what had happened because she had to at that point. I mean, she couldn't just not be pregnant and not explain it to them. That would seem very unusual. Um, and when communicates, she just don't talk about important things. So she shared with them that she had lost a child. And then she talked a bit about how her family was dealing with that, but always in a way to help children learn from her experience. So I, I would say if you are grieving and you wish to share that experience with your students, you might want to speak with someone else who isn't grieving, you know, a colleague or mental health professional in the school to make sure that what you're doing is helpful to the kids uh, because you, you lose the distance when you're acutely grieving. And so you may be thinking about what's helpful to you or what you wish you had known without thinking about really what's the best way for them to understand this. Um, and another view, if you have a student who recently suffered a loss and it uh, was a close relative, how would you prompt them to open up and talk? Would you push them to talk or would you let them take their time and ask you to come forward around the age of 10, particularly in this example? Sure. And, and actually in the simulations, uh, we use the same actors twice. And in the first, first uh, you know, simulation, the child is receptive to the invitation to talk. And then we do the same thing, but now the child is not receptive and is resistant. So we have kind of show how do, you, how do you have the conversation if the kid just opens up? And how do you have the conversation when the kid says, no, I don't want to talk about this, or seems resistant? Um, and it's not supposed to be the same pair of, you know, student and child over time. It's just in two different contexts. So part of what I tell people is, look, if you invite children to talk, it's an invitation and they have to accept the invitation. And sometimes they're not interested in talking to you about it um, or they may not be ready to talk about it. So what you want to do is to say, look, I'm ready. As that teacher had said, my door is always open and the other people will talk to you. Just let me know when you're ready. But then what you also need to do is just check in. You need to kind of have continued physical and emotional presence that says, I'm still here and I'm still wondering how you're doing. And it's okay if you don't want to talk about it, but I want you to know that I still want to talk about it when you're ready or if I can be of assistance. You know, I was, um, I, I remember hearing one person talk about the fact they were interviewing children. They were actually uh, adolescent males in a low income community. And one of the kids just kind of said, you know, she just kept asking me, you know, how I was doing and if I wanted to talk. And then I finally realized she actually does care, you know, 
because she continued to ask about it. So you don't want to nag children about it, but you want to keep saying, how are you doing now? Um, Do you want to talk about it? Is there another way I can help you? So you, you want to continue to be present, but I would enforce or coerce children to talk about it. Um, so this will be our last question for today. Um, do you think it would be wise or unwise to ask students at the beginning of the school year about loss? They could have a grandparent who died a few years ago, and I would not have no way of knowing that without asking. Yeah, I you know I was hearing a presentation that in one um, one group uh, was actually working with a number of school systems, and they actually created in this uh, kind of the registration information. They added a question about whether the child had experienced the death of a family member or friend that, you know, the school should be aware of. Um, And then that allowed, I think they were using school social workers, but it could be school counselors or could be the the teachers themselves as well, then, you know, could ask more questions about how are they doing? um, How can I support you through this? What is helpful? What should I be aware of? um, That might be a trigger or might be a point that upsets the child. Um, you know, what's worked in the past to provide support, what hasn't worked, and I should avoid. So I do think it's helpful, although, you know, it's the same thing. I talk with pediatricians and I say, you can't, like every pediatric visit, ask, did you have anyone die since I last saw you? But what you can say from the very beginning is, I'm here to help you not only with your medical problem, or for educators would be with your learning, but I'm also here to support you and, and to help you. So if something happens stressful in your life, whether that's a divorce, a death, a move, a serious illness of a family member or friend, I, you can talk with me about that and we can see if we can help. Um, and then when you, you know, maybe each year you might say, has there been anything stressful that's happened? You know, but so I, I, I don't know that you constantly have to keep asking about deaths because it could be divorce, it could be illness. There are many things uh, that can be stressful to kids. I think you do need to tell them this is this is what we're here for to help you and we're prepared to do that so we're actually doing a project now it's called the grief sensitive schools initiative uh, where we're working with schools and school districts to start implementing this material we've actually already made arrangements with four of the five largest school districts in the country to start rolling this out district-wide um, and the New York Life Foundation is actually um, having their workforce, their agents and other staff go to local schools to let them know about the materials and then award them a grant of $500 to become grief sensitive. And when the schools are grief sensitive, they even put a cling on their doorway or in their windows. It says we're grief sensitive and they communicate with the parent teacher organizations and others to say, if your child is grieving, we've had training and we're prepared to help them. Please let us know. So I think there is some benefit in formally letting parents and kids know this is okay to talk about. Um, But we also want to make sure that we're not just focusing on one thing, that we're supporting kids for the full range of stressors that they might have. Well, thank you so much for the Q&A. I think we got a lot of great information out of that as well on top of your webinar. Um, Just to close up, we will announce the giveaway winners now. Excuse me. The three winners for today are going to be Latia Dukes from D.C., Patricia Shigovia from New Jersey, and Julie Stewart from New Hampshire. Um, I will be contacting you shortly about sending you your prize. And I want to thank Dr. Schoenfeld again for this wonderful webinar. Um, I feel like we've had a lot of great information and, of course, the multitude of resources available at thegrievingstudent.com and schoolcrisiscenter.com. Um, I would encourage everyone to save these websites and information will be posted in the archive of edweb.net slash inclusive education. And just one correction, the, the website's end with .org instead oh, of Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. That's, .org. That's fine. I will type them correctly for sure. Yes. Um, and everyone, don't forget about your CE certificate. If you're watching it live, you'll get an email to you within the next 24 hours. And if you're joining us by phone or watching on demand, be sure to take the CE quiz to receive it. So that ends our webinar for today. So I'd just like to thank everyone again for attending. And uh, I appreciate you stopping by during the summer months during most of your breaks. Uh, Everyone, thank you again and see you next time at our next webinar.